This is the 27th video supplement for CIS 351, Grand Valley State University's course on computer organization and assembly language. This video discusses finite state machines. Now that we've discussed latches, flip-flops, and sequential circuits, we can start to design complete computers. In fact, the previous video shows you just about everything you need to know to design the most common type of computer. Now, it sounds like there must be a catch here, right? Well, let's see. What is the most common type of computer? Well, I'll give you a hint. It isn't a laptop or a phone. The most common type of computer out there is the embedded circuit that you'll find in things like toasters, washing machines, traffic lights, and so on. In many cases, the computational problems solved by these devices can be modeled with something called a finite state machine. This video will give a few examples of finite state machines and how to implement them using the techniques we've covered thus far in the course. A finite state machine can be used to model a problem that has only finitely many states. For example, consider the most simple use of a traffic light, a four-way intersection with the most basic red, yellow, green setup. No left turn arrows, traffic loops, cameras, or anything like that. So this simple system is only ever in one of four states. So the north-south road could have a red light while the east-west road has a green light, or the north-south road could have a red light while the east-west road has a yellow light, or north-south could be green while east-west is red, or north-south could be yellow while east-west is red. A finite state machine not only lists all the possible states like we've done here, but it also shows how you transition from one state to another. In this case, the transitions are simple. You always move from one state to the next. For example, if the light is currently green for the east-west street, the next thing the traffic light will do is turn yellow. We show this by placing an arc from the first state to the second. Similarly, after the east-west street has a yellow light, the light will turn red and the north-south road will get a green light. Then the north-south road gets a yellow light. And finally, the east-west road has a green light again. We can build a circuit that implements this behavior using the sequential circuit model from the previous video. First, we number the states. Then we create a two-bit register to remember this state. And now we just need a combinatorial circuit to compute the new state based on the current state. In this case, it's also helpful to have a combinatorial circuit that determines the color each light is supposed to display based on the current state. These combinatorial circuits are nothing special. You can implement them the same way you've implemented any of the combinatorial circuits thus far this semester, by taking the truth table and simplifying it using techniques such as Boolean algebra. In addition to what we've seen thus far, finite state machines also typically accept external input. For example, we could put a loop along the north-south road to sense traffic. That way, the east-west light only transitions from green to yellow when there's a vehicle waiting. We show this by putting a T on the arc from state 0 to state 1, which means we only make this transition when the input wire T has a value of true. If that input wire is false, then we remain in the same state. Notice we've shown this by drawing a transition from state 0 back to itself when T is false. Now that we've added an external input, we need to update our circuit accordingly. The new state now depends on both the current state and the value of t. Now the x in the truth table means that the value of t doesn't affect that particular transition. It's just a shortcut for having two identical lines for state, let's say, 1, 0. One where t is 0 and the other where t is 1. Both of these conditions transition to the state 1, 1, so we consolidate that into just one line of the truth table. Okay, now let's look at a slightly more complex example, a vending machine. To keep things reasonably simple, this vending machine only sells one item, and it costs 25 cents. The machine only accepts nickels, dimes, and quarters, and doesn't give any change. So, what are the states? Now, well, for this example, they're the different amounts of money that a user may have put in the machine during a transaction. So that would be a 0 cent, 5 cent, 10 cent, 15 cent, and 20 cent state. There's no 25 cent state because once the user has put 25 cents into the machine, he gets his newspaper and the machine resets to the 0 cent state in preparation for the next customer. Now there are other ways of handling the end of the transaction and the beginning of the next one, but I'm going to go with this simpler version just for this video. Now remember, there are three possible inputs, a nickel, a dime, and a quarter. If the customer first inserts a nickel, then we transition to the 5 cent state. If the customer inserts a dime, then we transition to the 10 cent state. 
If the customer enters a quarter, then we stay in the zero cent state, but instruct the machine to dispense the newspaper. And again, this self loop back into the zero cent state is something I'm doing just for this example. Other similar examples may have a separate state for just dispensing the newspaper. So remember, there is more than one way to do this. Now pause the video and fill in the rest of the transitions. So this is what I got. You can see here, for example, that once you've put a nickel in, if you put another nickel in, you end up in the 10 cent state. And if you put a dime in, you end in the 15 cent state. And if you put a quarter in, then you go back to the zero cent state and get your newspaper, but no change. We can implement this state machine using the same techniques we used for the traffic light. First, we number the states. And now notice we have five states this time, so we need three bits to remember what state we're in. And then next we add a register to store the current state. And now we need a truth table mapping the inputs and the current state to the desired next state and the output. We also add this register to that dispense output to prevent transient values from that combinatorial circuit from causing the newspaper to get dispensed too early. By adding the register, that final dispense signal will only reach the device that opens the lock at the end of the clock cycle after enough time has passed to ensure that the final value has been reached. In other words, this register ensures that a temporary transient change from a zero to a one on that wire doesn't cause the newspaper to get dispensed. It only gets dispensed if that one is still there at the end of the clock cycle when the register is allowed to take on a new value. This technique of numbering each state and then designing the combinatorial circuit based on those numbers is called binary encoding. Using this technique minimizes the number of state bits we need, but the resulting truth table can be relatively large. In this case, the truth table would have two to the six or 64 rows. Consequently, the resulting circuit may also be relatively large and complex. Also, even if it's not that complex, even if we can use some Boolean algebra to really simplify the circuit, you really can't tell at a glance by looking at the circuit what the finite state machine is doing. So with that in mind, another approach is called one hot. With one hot encoding, we don't number the states. Instead, we use a one bit register for each state. At any given time, exactly one of these registers will have a one in it and the other four should have a value of zero. That's where the name one hot comes from. Exactly one of the registers should be one. Now notice that this technique uses more state bits, five versus just three in this case. However, in exchange, we get a much simpler circuit. Using this one hot technique, we can build the circuit directly from the finite state diagram. We don't need to go through the truth table. So for example, when should the circuit enter the five cent state? Well, if you look at the state diagram, you'll see that there's only one transition into this state, which means the five cent state becomes one only when we're currently in the zero cent state and the customer inserts a nickel. So now, when will this circuit enter the 10 cent state? Well, this time there are two arcs into the 10 cent state. So we enter this state when either we start in the five cent state and the user inserts a nickel, or we start in the zero cent state and the user inserts a dime. So pause the video and see if you can follow this pattern and finish this circuit. Okay, here's what I got. We can see that same AND gate entering the five cent state and the two choices entering the 10 cent state. And then similarly, we can see that to get into the 15 cent state, you either start in the 5 cent state and add a dime, or you start in the 10 cent state and add a nickel. Similarly, for the 20 cent state, you can start in the 15 cent state and add a nickel, or you can start in the 10 cent state and add a dime. And of course, there's a number of ways to get back to the zero state. Any combination of states and money that puts you over the 25 cent threshold sends you back to the zero state and also produces that output that will open the machine to let you get your newspaper. The other cool thing about a one-hot encoding is that you can work backwards. We can take this circuit and reconstruct the finite state diagram in a pretty straightforward way. Like we can look here and see that the 20 cent state has two arcs coming into it 
a transition from the 15 cent state based on a nickel and a transition from the 10 cent state based on a dime and so on. Now one last caveat. The purpose of this video was to provide a high level understanding of finite state machines and how they can be implemented. Realize, however, that the real world is more complicated. There are entire engineering courses devoted to the details of designing embedded circuits, even simple ones like this vending machine. There are a lot of details that I left out because they're out of scope for this computer science course. However, even though we've only just scratched the surface, you should still be able to design a finite state machine to solve a given problem, and then design a sequential circuit that implements that finite state machine. You should also be able to work backwards and generate a finite state machine from a complete one-hot circuit. Now, in the next video, we'll begin designing a complete real CPU, like a real general purpose CPU that you might find in a desktop or a laptop or a phone.